Welcome to the Slam and Jam here on the Athletic MBA Show. Go to theathletic.com slash MBA Show and get the Athletic for a discounted rate. You can read all sorts of articles about trades. You can read, uh, there's a great breakdown of the Siakam deal by multiple writers, honestly. And it's great. Gives you a, a great insight as to how the deal broke down. And, and maybe where the Pacers are headed after this. So please go check that out. With me, as always, is my good friend Alex Spears. Alex, tell me what happened in the NBA this week. Well, Andrew, it all started last Friday night with a battle of two teams at the bottom of the standings, the Spurs versus the Hornets. Why am I talking about this game? Because Victor Wembanyama has been on a tear recently, and it's worth yeah. mentioning. Uh, first, the game, Spurs won 135-99. Uh, Charlotte has lost six in a row. Spurs still only have seven wins. Who cares? Both of these teams are firmly in the race for one of the 15 players that may go number one in this year's draft. The important thing is that since moving to center from power forward on December 8th, Victor Wembanyama is averaging 21-11 and 11 with three and a half assists and 3.7 blocks per game wow. while shooting 50% from the field, previously shooting 43% from the field. That is impressive. On Saturday, it was another rookie who shined for his team, Jordan Hawkins, for the Pelicans. In a 118-108 to win over Dallas, Hawkins scored a game-high 34 points, including 6 of 12 from 3. There have only been 11 30-point games from rookies this season. Wemby has three of them, Chet has three, and Jordan Hawkins has two. As a wow. rookie, Hawkins wow. is shooting 39% from three on 5.6 attempts per game. Wow. The Pelicans have won seven of their last 10 and are now fifth in the West. On Sunday, we had an incredible game with an incredible finish. Kings at Bucks. It was close all game, but in the final minutes of the fourth, it looked like the Bucks were starting to gain control. Up five with 73 seconds left. The Bucks had an 87% chance of winning. In the next minute, however, De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk would score 10 points to send the game to overtime. Then in OT, it was the Kings who looked like they were in control, up four with only 18 seconds left, and Malik Monk heading to the line for two. But Monk would miss both free throws, which would follow a Brook Lopez three, and then De'Aaron Fox missed a free throw, all leading to the final play. Damian Lillard getting the ball in the backcourt, dribbling to just outside the top of the key, and hitting the three to win it as time expired. We'll talk about the Bucks a little bit more later, but for the Kings, things are still weird. They have now lost four in a row, and while three of those losses were completely understandable, on the road to Philly, Milwaukee, and Phoenix, on Thursday night, they lost to the Pacers at home, who were without four of their main rotation guys. On Monday, it was a night for revenge. Who can forget the battle between the Pistons and Wizards when Detroit was in the midst of their 28-game losing streak? What seemed like the best chance for Detroit to prevent history end it in a 19-point loss for the Pistons at the time. But on Monday night, the Pistons were out for blood. Alec Burks, 34 points, including eight threes. Jay Nivey, 24, 7, and 6. Jalen Duran, 20, 19, and 4 on 8 of 8 from the field. And in the end, it was a 129-117 to 117 win for the Pistons, their fourth of the season. Since December 30th, Andrew, how many teams do you think have won fewer games than the Pistons? What would you guess? <laughs> uh one three three washington charlotte and brooklyn wow have all only won one game yeah, since brooklyn. december 30th while the pistons have won two are yeah. things looking up for detroit <laughs> well if you're cool with a very loose definition of up yes they are <laughs> on tuesday it was the game of the week the denver nuggets at the philadelphia 76ers Jokic versus Embiid, murray versus maxi mpj versus tsunami poppy it was an incredibly tight game throughout, with 16 lead changes and the largest lead only being 10. While Jokic is 25 and 19, nothing to sneeze at, Joel Embiid put up 41, 7, and 10, leading the Sixers to the 126 121 victory. The Sixers have now won three in a row and will meet the Nuggets again, this time in Denver, next Saturday on ABC. Also on Tuesday, on a very serious note, Warriors assistant coach Dejan Milojevic was rushed to the hospital after suffering a heart attack during a team dinner. Milojevic passed away the following day at age 46. Milojevic played professionally, and he was named the Adriatic League Most Valuable Player three times in a row. He also helped the Serbia and Montenegro national team win Eurobasket in 2001. He later went into coaching 
where he would coach future NBA players, including Goga Batadze, Ivica Zubats, and Nikola Jokic. He has been an assistant coach for the Warriors since 2021. The Warriors games on Wednesday and Friday were both postponed as the team mourns the loss of their beloved coach. On Wednesday, we had a blowout in Cleveland. Missing Giannis, the Bucks fell behind quickly to Cleveland and ended up losing by 40, 135 to 95. The Cavs, who are still without Evan Mobley, still without Darius Garland, have won six in a row, the longest active winning streak in the league. They are now 11 and three since both Mobley and Garland left the lineup and are fourth in the East. Also on Wednesday, give me some Raptors news. For the second time in the past month, we got a huge Raptors trade. Yeah. Pascal Siakam is heading to the Indiana Pacers in exchange for Bruce Brown, Jordan Nawara, and three first round picks. Siakam is a huge front court boost to a team that has won seven of 10 and currently sits seventh in the East at 24 and 17, but only one game out of the fourth seat for the Pacers. Finally, on Thursday night, we had a great one between the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Utah Jazz. The Thunder came into the game on a two-game losing streak after having dropped both games of a back-to-back -back in L.A. The Jazz, on the other hand, were riding a six-game winning streak into Thursday night. The Thunder ended up winning 134 to 127. And listen, you know all about Shea Gilders Alexander. He had another great game. He's great. But what about Jalen Williams, a.k.a. J-Dub? J-Dub put up 27 points on 11 of 14 shooting to go along with eight assists, two steals, and two blocks. Over his last 20 games, J-Dub is averaging 24 and 5 on 59, 53, 78 splits. More importantly, he's been making his mark in the fourth quarter. Shane Young at Young NBA on Twitter posted his fourth quarter stats from the season, 28 points per 36 minutes with 62, 59, 83 splits. That's what he's doing in fourth quarters. No. <laughs> Up next for the Thunder is a showdown with the number one team in the West, the Minnesota Timberwolves, in Minnesota on Saturday night. What a week it was, Andrew. What a week indeed. Uh, it's trade season, so we're going to talk to our guy, Sam Vecini, right now. Well, Al, it's trade season officially. It's time to start talking about trades. First, we had the Pascal Siakam deal and many more trades to come, I assume. And the person I wanted to talk to about trades is our guy, Sam Vecini. He covers the draft. He also covers the NBA. For us here at The Athletic, he also has a podcast called The Game Theory Podcast, which you can watch on YouTube if you like watching podcasts on YouTube. Uh, Sam, how's it going, man? I'm doing great, Andrew. It's the summer here. I don't have to worry about the snow. I don't have to worry about the ice. Like, Wow. What a flex. You know, what a flex. It's, it's, it's summer here. here gonna... Sunny Australia. Wow. Wow. I did not expect. To uh, to hear anything about you being south of the equator, but here we are. Here we yeah, are. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just gotta flex on that south <laughs> of the equator kind of stuff. Uh, hey, let's start with this. Uh, let's start with the Pascal Siakam deal, and and also if you want to hear a, a ton more about it, the the guys at the Tampering Show did such a great job covering it today. Uh, Sam Amick had some like really great details about about Siakam himself and kind of like his his thoughts on the deal and kind of what his camp thought about it. So you should go listen to that. But we have Siakam going to Indiana for three first round picks, Jordan Wara and Bruce Brown. Um, how much of a needle mover do you think this is um, for the Pacers? And like, what can the Pacers do in the East now? Yeah, I think it's a significant needle mover for them because Siakam is probably at least this version of him. And look, we'll talk about the long-term ramifications of this deal here in a minute, but this version of Pascal Siakam is kind of tailor made for this Indiana offense in such a significant way. Yeah. He is one of the best transition players in the NBA. Uh, if you look at uh, his points per game in transition, I think he averages like 5.7 or so, which is in the top 10, I believe, in the NBA. He's in the top 10% of all players in terms of transition efficiency. He is a fantastic, fantastic fit with that part of the Pacers attack. And that's a significant part of the Pacers attack, right? They score, you know, the third most points in per game off of turnovers in the NBA. The third highest percentage of their possessions in the NBA are in transition, right? Uh, they've tied for the most points per game in transition per synergy, right? Like they're in the top 10 in field goal percentage, top nine in effective field goal percentage in transition. And now they have this guy who is this six foot nine dude 
who runs like a deer flies down the court every single time has exceptional motor and he's going to be able to create all sorts of incredible opportunities for Tyrese Halliburton looking around for options as he surveys the game coming down the court. Uh, that piece of it is great. The other piece of it that's really interesting is that the Pacers currently in the NBA right now are third in drives per game. They are third in the NBA in points off of drives per game. I would say that they're doing that despite the fact that I don't believe they have like what I would say is a truly dynamic driver of the basketball mm. on their roster. Yeah. Uh, all due respect to Tyrese Halliburton. Tyrese Halliburton is incredible. He is one of the smartest players in the NBA. He is able to use the threat of his shot and his passing ability and his overall intelligence to get to the rim. But I wouldn't call him like dynamic as a driver. Pascal Siakam is one of the most dynamic drivers in the NBA of the basketball. And he's been doing that despite playing in a Toronto offense that has not finished higher and higher than 20th yeah. in either three point percentage or three point attempt rate over e each of the last three seasons. They've not finished higher than 20th in either of those metrics. If you watch Raptors games, the offense is still a little bit stagnant. Oftentimes he's driving into a paint where there are multiple guys just waiting there to go and get him or to try and cut off his drives or to be there at the rim and help. The Pacers, part of why they've been so successful driving the basketball to the rim, and really, in my opinion, the significant reason is because they space the court so incredibly well. So now you're putting one of the best drivers in the NBA into a circumstance that he hasn't played for really in like four years at this point. Yeah. Where he's going to be able to get to the rim when he wants and they're going to be able to run all sorts of interesting creative actions off of him. Miles Turner is a spacing five. They can run these weird like four or five, you know, combination ball screens. They can run any combination, in my opinion, of ball screens for any of their players one through four in what will likely be the starting lineup. Like they like to run the Halliburton healed ball screen occasionally where healed ghosts for Halliburton. They can run Siakam Halliburton ball screens now yeah. they can run you know whatever they want to do they can get really really fun and creative with all of the movement all of the dribble handoffs that they look to do i think it's going to be about as tailor made a fit as you can find on offense and then defensively i think siakam's been much better this year than what he's been in the last couple of years uh his energy his mobility uh his effort level on that end i think has really improved as scotty barnes has been able to take more offensive responsibility off of his table. Siakam is going to be a real needle mover for them. Like, I think this is now probably in the regular season, at least. I think I would say they're going to be a top four team in the East yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens in the playoffs. Like we need to see what these guys look like, but th there's every reason to believe that this is going to be a very, very, very good basketball team. Yeah, and, and how comfortable would you be willing to give him the max this summer? The Pacers have said that they would give it to him. It's five years, two hundred forty-seven million. I mean, it's it's a big, big commitment to Siakam. So the, have you have you has some did Sam say that that they'd be willing to give him the max? Is that is that what there was there was like a report today that the Indiana was reported reportedly comfortable with it or or willing yeah. to do it or something like that. So. I'm going to be just like fascinated to see how that goes yeah. because with the Pacers, Siakam is eligible to get five years, you know, in the ballpark of 247 million. Mm -hmm. We don't know the exact number because the salary cap needs to be set still. Right. Right. With another team, he is eligible for four years, about $183 million, yeah. something yeah. in that ballpark. That's a big gap, guys. <laughs> like, that's yeah. a lot of wiggle room for these teams to come in and try and find a solution that pays Siakam more guaranteed than maybe what he would get from another team, but maybe a little bit less than what the max is. 
Maybe it involves like a team option on the fifth year, maybe a partial guarantee Mm -hmm. on a fifth year, something like that. Some way to potentially mitigate the downside of like a 35 year old Pascal Siakam not being quite as good as what he is now. And I think there are reasons to believe that that will be the case. I think there's enough wiggle room to where I would bet that the contract is. I don't, I don't know the answer to this, uh, but I would bet you that there is a real chance to where they can find a middle ground that makes sense for both parties. So uh, bouncing off the Siakam deal, how do you evaluate Bruce Brown's half season in Indy? Because we all saw how important of a role he played in Denver's championship run. But in yeah. Indy, it didn't seem to work quite as well. His advanced stats are down across the board. Why didn't it totally work in Indy? And how do you value him as a potential trade target or just as a Raptor? He was playing tonight, had a great game. Yeah, I'll be really interested to see what they decide to do with him. Uh, for a reason I'll explain momentarily. I'll answer your initial question first. I think that it started out quite well. He was knocking down shots. Things seemed to be rolling. And then I think that it got a little bit more fraught in terms of fit. He, What the Pacers need above all defensively from somebody right now, and this is part of where I think Siakam can be so, so valuable for them, is somebody who can deal with like bigger wings, right? So in the last 16 games, the Pacers have given up 32 on 15 shots to Lowry Markinen, 25 to Michael Porter, 38 to Jason Tatum, then 40 the next game from Jalen Brown. They give up 34 to Paulo Bancaro on December 23rd. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George combined for 63 in what was like a truly catastrophic defensive game against the Clippers uh, in December at one point. And then this is like the crazy one. Patrick Williams dropped 22 on them. Uh, that, that's the sixth most Pat Williams has ever scored in a game. He's played 210 games at this point in his career. Yeah. And that is uh, the sixth most he's ever scored in a game. They needed somebody that could guard like bigger wings above all. And a lot of the time it fell to Aaron Naismith. I think Aaron Naismith is a little bit better on like true wings. And Bruce Brown would occasionally have to deal with things like this as well. And Bruce is just smaller. He is yeah. not is good at dealing with those. He can manage because he's strong, he's physical, but he's just not, he wasn't the answer for them in terms of what they needed on a possession by possession basis. I think that as the season wore on, it just continued to deteriorate in terms Mm -hmm. of what the issues were with the exact fit of him in Indiana. I think it makes a little bit more sense in Toronto as presently constructed. I think that it would probably make even more sense somewhere else. If I'm being transparent, Uh, Bruce Brown has a really interesting contract structure now where he's, you know, obviously paid like 22 million this year. Next year, he has a team option for 23 million. The Raptors theoretically, if they would, want to do something like this they could take that to the draft with bruce brown yeah to a team that's like a real contender and say hey you're a team that doesn't really have another mechanism to bring in bruce brown right we'll trade him to you or we'll like give picks or anything like that he'll pick up his team option and you give us assets basically what the raptors are going to have to decide is Is it more valuable to move him now or to wait until something like around the draft before he has his team option kick in on June Mm -hmm. 29th? Yeah. To where they can find an interesting solution. Uh, I I don't know what the answer to that is going to be, though. Like, I think that you could make a case for it either way. Yeah. Now the Raptors like have all these picks in this upcoming draft, you know, from from the deal. You just wonder if if maybe now is a good time to try to test the waters for Bruce Brown. Are there any teams that you think like sh- they, that should try yeah. to get him? Yeah. I mean, like, I think that it makes some sense for the Lakers to go for something like this. Like if the Lakers would be willing to do like D'Angelo Russell in some sort of like asset value for Bruce Brown. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, yeah. would have to be like substantial asset value in some regard. But I, I think that's a deal that helps the Lakers. Uh, yeah. If the, you know, the Warriors could find a deal that makes sense, like, could you do something like, like I, was, I was trying to decide, like, if you're, if you're the Raptors, would you be willing to take the Andrew Wiggins deal if the uh, Raptors also tossed in Moses Moody? Or if the Warriors mm. tossed in Moses Moody? Yeah. I kind of like that. No. Yeah. No? I don't think. No. <laughs> I don't think I would if I was the Raptors for what it's worth. Just collecting but, all the Canadians. <laughs> yeah. That's the only upside. I mean, it's kind of yeah, cool. Like, it's, uh, it's unlocked RJ Barrett. It'll just unlock Wiggins. I mean, you just have this like monster Canadian team. Wiggins has been quite bad this year, uh, which is <laughs> concerning, uh, given that he is on a four-year deal now worth, yeah. uh, I think, over I $100 million. A, a deal so, that everybody thought was like, how did the Warriors pull this off? You know, yeah, it wasn't that long ago that people were saying that. That turned, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and look, like, these things turn back, right? Like, Duncan Robinson... Yeah. Yeah. is untradeable totally. right now for Miami, yeah. truly. So yeah, awesome. you never know. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you truly never know. Uh, the, the Warriors, you know, maybe they could find a way to do something like that where they yeah. attach, you know, Wiggins and an asset for Bruce Brown. I, I don't know. Like, I'm just kind of spitballing. Like, they're, like, I could see Bruce Brown being, like, the most Tom Thibodeau player of all time. Like, that yeah. would make a lot of sense. He's yeah. not what they need, but. You, you never know with Tibbs. Like he might just go, yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. Also, uh, I mean, Bruce Brown, CAA uh, client. So like that's a right. useful mm. thing. I mean, some Thunder fans are like drawing the line. Like the, the Thunder have the Stavis Bertans contract, yeah. you know. And I think, and obviously the Thunder don't need another like six three six four guard that does everything. They have tons of those guys. But all the guys that have to do that outside of Dort are totally inexperienced. And, like if the Thunder want to make a playoff right. run, I think just having Bruce Brown around for a couple of years, I think could be helpful. Or even just this year. Like if you, do, if you could do Bruce Brown for Davis Bertans in one of the 45,000 picks that the Oklahoma yeah. city thunder have moving yeah. forward, it's yeah. not a bad idea. Uh, the other piece for the thunder is like, I think the thunder more than anything, just need to go find a big that can match up with Nikola Jokic in a playoff series. Like I, I just don't, I don't love the idea of Chet having to deal with that for 48 minutes a game and yeah. then them not having anybody else that can do it. Like you essentially have to match Chet's minutes to Jokic and that feels like a problem. I would yeah. just want another body. The good news for Thunder is that they have the Mitsich and Poku deals that can get them up to like, I think they can move those guys for up to like a contract worth $15 million. So there's like a little bit of flexibility to be able to maybe answer both questions. If you wanted yeah. those things, I, I just don't know what the thunder are going to do. Uh, they are, they are their usual quiet selves, uh, you know, multiple weeks out to the deadline right now. Right. Uh, according to the people I talk to, at least they, they have, um, they're, they're not, uh, they're not like out there. Uh, yeah, the, the, the way that I would phrase it is like they'll be opportunistic if something yeah. comes out, but they're not out there to force anything to happen. Right. Well, and like a, a thing for them that, you know, a couple of other teams have told me is like, look, the way that they will sometimes operate is they'll say, hey, we like our team. We love our team. We're not going to yeah. do anything. And then like two days before the deadline, you know, just so that. Yeah, you know, nothing gets out. There's no leaks. There's no anything. They'll go to somebody and say, "Hey, like, you know, what about this? What about yeah. that?" I just, I, I would be floored if they did nothing with that Bertans contract. Like, I would be really, really shocked. I would be too, for what it's worth. Uh, I, I would be really surprised. Like Kelly Olynyk is sitting right there and makes a lot of sense. You, you think the Jazz would trade him now? Like, this is a, that's a that's a guy who's like on the list who I think is he's like tailor made to play for the Thunder. No, I know. That's what I keep thinking as well. Uh, you know, dribble pass shoot is a big. That's exactly yeah. the thing that the Thunder love to have. Uh, I think and the Jazz chat too, which is like another thing. It's like getting a yeah. big that you feel comfortable playing with Chet is like not the easiest thing, especially if you want to continue to play the way you want to play. Like you can yep. still do it with him. He, he's basically like their backup point guard 
in Utah. Yeah, totally. No, that's that's what they do. They like throw him the ball, like entry passes, like at the top of the key, and just like have him kind of operate their offense for yeah. swaths of time. Uh, look, the, the Jazz. I think they understand that Kelly Olynyk is on an expiring contract, mm-hmm. and their front court situation is crowded with yeah. Larry Markinen, John Collins, Walker Kessler. Taylor Hendricks, right? Yeah. Like I would Hendricks say thing, that the Hendricks thing does make it more interesting because like they just can't find any time for him. Right. All four of those guys are likely bigger pieces of the Jazz's future than Kelly Olenek is. Yeah. Is Kelly Olenek such a valuable piece to them this season that it's worth losing him for nothing potentially in the off season? Because like Kelly Olenek probably going to want to go find somewhere where he knows he's going to get consistent playing time. Yeah. I think the Jazz would love to retain him, but like I, I don't. Can they can they promise him minutes even like next season? I, I don't know if they can necessarily right, right now. So it, it'll be interesting to see what they do. They might keep him. They might just say like we really want to be as good as we can be this season, and Kelly Olynyk's a big piece of that. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, they could they could also like save the Jazz a lot of money because of this Bertans deal. They could take back. Olenek and Taylor Horton Tucker's expiring contracts and like save, save the, uh, the jazz some money, you know, this season, they could save like 6 million bucks by taking yeah, and, those guys. It, and like the idea that I kind of came up with was like, let's say the jazz really want that 2024 first round pick to transfer this year. Right. Yeah. Cause they, they want to clear their cap, clear their pick books moving forward. They want to make sure that, uh, you know, that, they transfer this pick in what is considered a down draft at the top. The Thunder could theoretically like remove some protections yeah. on that pick for, yeah. you know, and say like, Hey, we will say that this pick transfers this year. Give us a, you know, we'll give you a second round pick in addition to that, or two second round picks in addition to that. And, you know, do Olenek and Bertons for, uh, as a deal, like something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, there's there's enough like synergy there between those two teams because they're connected by their pick this year to where I wonder yeah. if um, it does line up a little bit, but we'll see. You know, it's yeah. it's early in the process still. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about the Sixers. The, the the pitch for the post Harden Sixers was that they would have a ton of cap space next summer, and like when the idea was to land somebody to pair with and beat a Maxi. Now OG's off the market. Pascal, Kawhi, Paul George is likely going to be joining them too. Who are your favorite remaining targets for the Sixers, either before the deadline or maybe even this summer? Yeah, before the deadline, it's really hard because I think you want to try and find guys that you know are on expiring deals that allow the Sixers to maintain flexibility. Like, I don't love the idea of DeJounte Murray for them. Uh, it just like doesn't totally line up for me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't love the fit between him and Maxi. I would want the ball in Maxi's hands uh, as much as possible. And I also, it, it's, it, I've been frustrated with DeJounte's defense this year, even though like in theory, he's not, taking as many possessions as he was late in his career in San Antonio. So yeah. theoretically, like you'd think he'd be able to expend more energy defensively, but like uh-huh. his off ball engagement, it feels like has been a little bit rough. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see like if he goes somewhere at the deadline, what does he look like on defense? Maybe he just like wants to be out of Atlanta. Um, and that's speculative. That's not reported. Right. Um, you, you never know what that could look like. Uh, th- the names for me that line up, for Philly are Alex Caruso and DeMar DeRozan. Uh, Caruso is on a cheap enough deal to where he doesn't impact a ton of their flexibility in the summer. I think they could really use like an awesome backcourt defensive partner next to uh, Tyrese Maxey in addition to DeAnthony Melton. I also think that DeRozan is like the secondary scorer that lines up probably best with what their kind of incentives are at this yeah. point to keep flexibility, but also to try and find that secondary scoring punch or to find that 
secondary offensive creation, like when they take Tyrese Maxey off the court, they don't really have like a lot of like backcourt creators. Like that's why Kelly Oubre has been useful for them this season yeah. is because he's just somebody who can go get a shot on some level. And they don't have a lot of those guys really who are capable of that. And most of the guys they do have in that regard are not really like high level distributors, right? They're not like ball movers. They're more scoring threats. Kelly Olenek, Tyrese Maxey. Maxey's gotten better as a distributor, but like he's not, like a true point guard still. He's more of like a combo guard that focuses more on scoring. It, it feels like getting somebody like Caruso that like really moves the ball at a super high level, processes the game, moves it quickly, and then finding like a secondary high level offensive option like DeMar DeRozan could make sense. But at the end of the day, I kind of wonder if they just roll this over until the summer. Uh, maybe you do something small. Maybe you can get like a Gordon Hayward for the Marcus Morris and Robert Covington contracts. And like mm. you attach a couple of second round picks to that. Uh, maybe you do something like Boyan Bogdanovich who has that super cheap. Uh, what is it? It's like a non guarantee for next season, like a very small partial guarantee for next season. Uh, you know, maybe it's a Tyus Jones that can be like a point guard who has an expiring deal. I think that they look more on that level. If you made me bet, unless we find that there is some other star out there that is unhappy and just has not made himself uh, known yet at this stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the Tyus Jones idea. I know that's like not necessarily like some big needle mover, but just to have another point guard that can also play off guard, I think is helpful. Yeah. Tyus's track record in the playoffs is a little spotty, uh, sure. which worries me a little bit. Uh, for them specifically, also like a backcourt of him and Maxi, I think would be quite small in the playoffs. Oh. But yeah. as a like, if you're just trying to find a really good backup point guard that can run the show for you for 17 minutes, 16 minutes, yeah, when Maxi is off the court, and then in the playoffs, like for seven minutes when Maxi's off the court, in all likelihood, uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Matt Jones could make sense depending on the price point, but I, I don't, I wouldn't want to give up a first for him at least. Oh yeah. Um, so I want to go. I want to head a little north, Sam, to the uh, Brooklyn Nets. Only had one player. Your, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're super interesting because you know, like a month ago, it, it makes sense that you only had one guy in your top thirty-five of your trade board is Royce O'Neal. They've won three of their last seventeen games. Two yeah. against Detroit. One against OKC. They're now outside of the plan. Several players who theoretically would be coveted by contending teams, but they also do not have full control of their picks until 2028, yeah. which makes rebuilding moves more difficult. How would you approach this deadline if you were with the Nets? Yeah, truly. Look, I, I would sell if it was me. So you're asking like what I would do. I, I would yeah. sell. I would move Mikel Bridges. I would move oh, really? okay. everything I can and try and like get everything gone. Yeah, like to me, like, what we've seen from Mikhail in Brooklyn, and I, there probably has not been a bigger fan of Mikhail Bridges in the public sphere than me uh, among national media. I have loved Mikhail Bridges. I think he is a stud. I think he is like the perfect third or fourth option for a great team. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a number one, and they need to find the number one guy. Like they just really, really do. And look, maybe they can while Bridges is on the roster still, but you know, Mikhail is what I think he has two and a half years left on that contract. Getting him would really potentially help another team, but also trading him, I think would allow them to get very significant pick capital in a way that would really help them. Like if you're, if you're Memphis, you're looking like you're probably in a circumstance where you're going to end up with like a top five pick this year, something like that. You probably move that pick and other stuff for Mikael Bridges right now, knowing that you're going to have John Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart back next season. And your closing lineup at that point can be John Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, Mikael Bridges, Jaron Jackson Jr. Like, 
that is an absurd lineup that would be awesome. And that's just like one of the teams that I think could theoretically try and get involved. And like, that's a team that like nobody is considering a buyer right now because they shouldn't be buying given that they had an absurd number of injuries all happen in a single week with Bain and smart and jaw going down. Like, I I think there are so many teams that would be involved in a Mikhail bridges, like potential sweepstakes that it would drive the price through the roof. Uh, He's making $22 million a year for the next, you know, two years beyond this one. He is just the perfect guy for so many teams. Like if you're the Lakers, you give up everything that you have for him. I think if you're, you know, if you're the thunder, you give up everything that you've, you know, not everything. Cause they have way too much, but like you give up a lot of what the nets want. I think for Mikhail bridges. Yeah. If you know, if you're, I'm just like trying to think of like other great teams. If you're Philly, I think he really would help Philly a lot. Like that would make an immense amount of sense for them. Uh, if you're, I'm trying to think of teams that have like a lot of assets. If you're New Orleans, I think that's the kind of like guy that would really represent an interesting shakeup move for them in some way if they wanted to, uh, and like a good buy for them, a good buy opportunity because they have a lot of picks. Uh, if yeah. you're the Knicks, I think that you go for that and just continue to build the Villanova uh, pipeline, right? Like yeah. every team, Miami would have an immense amount of interest. I would think. Well, Al- every Al- team. Just to me the other day, Houston. Because Houston yeah. offers something to the Nets that nobody else can, and is that control over your own picks again, which is like so the here's, problem for them. So here's that's like the biggest catch twenty two in the league, right? So if you're Houston, mm-hmm. you have these picks. You have three more years of their picks, I believe, beyond this one, right? Yeah. Do you trade? one or two of those for Mikhail Bridges, knowing that if you do that, these picks are going to be like really high leverage, high value picks. Yeah. Or do you assume that if they're looking to move Mikhail Bridges to you, potentially that they're also probably looking to Mikhail Bridges to look to move Mikhail Bridges elsewhere. And thus you can get the full value of those picks on right. your own where those might end up being seriously like top five picks. If yeah. They move Mikhail yeah. Bridges. Yeah. And assume that we can just have like a pipeline of talent coming in. That's like cost controlled and like unbelievably good and right. super high, like leverage talent or just like super high leverage picks that you could move in a deal for something like that. If I'm Houston, I kind of lean toward the latter. If I'm them. Yeah. If they're offering Mikhail Bridges to me, I'm kind of assuming that they'd be, and I'm not saying that they are for what it's worth yeah, with Brooklyn. Yeah. Like I've not gotten any impression that they're offering Mikhail Bridges. This is all hypothetical based on what I would do according to Alex's uh, question here. But <laughs> I have to say that just so people don't like, you know, lose their minds. Yeah. But if I'm Houston, like I kind of bet that, you know, if they're talking to me about Mikhail Bridges, they're probably talking to other teams about Mikhail Bridges. And I would assume he's going to get moved and I'm going to bet that these picks will be very high value. And I, if, if that's the case, like I wouldn't want to move those picks. For yeah. Bridges. Like, but, I, but I don't, I don't know if I would, I, I might move one see. of them, Yeah, but yeah, I don't know about a lot of them, but, the, but because they hold so much value and they have Houston's got like some, like some bigger, unique expiring contracts and Jeff green, Victor Oladipo. Like you could just trade them basically Oladipo, Jeff Green, and these picks because, like, those picks really do hold the future. Like, yeah. this is why, like, the Nets are so uncertain about what they should do because their future is in a stranglehold because of these picks. And so, like, if they could get them back somehow, like, Houston wouldn't have to give up any of their young prospects for it because they hold so much value. Yeah. So, it's just a really interesting mm-hmm. situation. Here's here's like also the great question for this hypothetical and to be clear, still a hypothetical, because, again, as far as I know, I have not heard anything about Mikhail Bridges actually being on the market right now. Yeah. Uh, people seem to think that that's probably not going to happen. Two weeks still to go. Anything could change. But as of right now, that seems like it's the case. If you're talking specifically about Houston, though, would you rather move like Jalen Green? 
than one of these picks? I, I probably would. Yes. And if you're Brooklyn, yeah. like, do you, if you're Brooklyn and you're putting Mikhail Bridges on the market, you're probably going to find something better than Jalen Green upside wise, but like, I'm not a thousand percent sure. Are you? Um, I'm a thousand percent sure. Yes, I'm sure. You think so? Yes. Okay. I like to like, in fact, I've been a thousand percent sure. Wow. I've been low on Jalen Green for a while. So like this yeah. is coming from me, but there is still like some, there is like still a real chance that he can be like a high level scorer in the NBA on some level. Sure. But again, like the point, uh, the point you're making is the pick <laughs> without giving up, uh, yeah, without giving up like their younger prospects. Yeah. I, I just, if I'm Houston, I'm kind of playing the game of chicken the other way. Yeah. 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 And saying, I get that. Well, I'd rather just have the picks and you're probably going to move this guy anyway. So now we're going to end up with like probably two top five picks in the future. So why wouldn't we like, would you trade Mikhail Bridges for a top five pick this year? For this year? No. That's all I'm getting. No, no. Yeah. I would rather have Mikhail Bridges than that. Uh, would Especially- you, would you trade Mikhail Bridges? Like, so like, let's put actual names to this for a second. Okay, let's do it. Would you trade Mikhail Bridges if you're Houston? Okay, if you're Houston, would you trade Alex Sar and VJ Edgum <laughs> for Mikhail Bridges? If I was Houston? Yeah. No chance, yeah. right? What? You would trade both of those. You'd be willing to trade both of those guys for Mikael Bridges. Houston's the eight they, years that come with team control over both of that. them for Mikael Bridges that. for two years. They already have two very highly touted prospects in Cam Whitmore and Amin Thompson that they can't even play that much. They just went through four years of tanking. They really need two more young guys that they have to develop. Like they're ready. They want to win now. They're, they made that deal for Van Vliet brought in Jeff Green, brought in all these vets because they wanted to win now. So I'll, I'll counter that and say, okay, if that's the case and you think they should move those picks then, yeah, is Mikhail Bridges the best you can do by moving those picks? That That is a better question. That's a yeah. yeah. I think the answer is, and I love, again, big, big, big Mikhail Bridges fan. I think he's outstanding. It's been weird to see him struggle a little bit on defense this year. Uh, you know, again, as you pick up offensive usage, sometimes those you know struggles can happen a little bit more often. But yeah, like I, I think that you can do better than Mikael Bridges if you're offering that kind of high upside pick value. Like, the especially picks that if were just he traded, does get traded somewhere else, then all of a sudden now you have like the most valuable picks in the league. Correct, yeah. and we just saw like Pascal Siakam get traded for three first round picks that might not be all that valuable, right? Yeah. And Siakam is a better player than Mikael Bridges. Uh, he's going to be more expensive than Mikael, which is a factor that matters too. But like, th- I would rather have Siakam than Mikael Bridges. So if that's the kind of player that you can get for three first round picks, even if he's expiring, whatever, uh, there are factors why those picks were those picks. I'm thinking if I'm Houston, I can probably do better than Mikael Bridges for those picks. Mm-hmm. And if they're offering me Mikhail Bridges, it means they're probably offering Mikhail Bridges elsewhere. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of like, little game theory. Uh, that's same right. Scene. That's right. This is what I think through here. Uh, no, but um, in terms of like the other stuff with the Nets, to continue to answer your question, because now we've talked <laughs> about the Nets for a while. Seriously, the Nets are like the most interesting team at the deadline to me so far because Definitely. I. Definitely. And by the way, teams around the league like don't really know what they're going to do at the end of the day because they do tend to get involved in like star conversations when these guys come available because they do have all of these picks, but also they're bad. So what do you how do you square that circle is difficult for them. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. Like they have a lot of guys that I think a lot of teams would really like. Uh, Royce O'Neal, I think, would be a really nice addition for a bunch of teams uh you know a guy that can knock down 37 to 39 percent of threes give a ton of defensive energy and effort on an expiring contract that's a valuable player for somebody 
Nick Claxton is on an expiring contract and, you know, was one of the six best defensive players in the NBA last season. Uh, this season, he's not been quite that, but he's a guy that is really valuable. Uh, you know, Dorian Finney-Smith has proven in Dallas in the past that he can be a really valuable player uh, for a number of different teams. He's hitting 40% from three this season. He's versatile defensively. He's big. He's long. He can take on guys two through four consistently. There's just a lot of guys that I think can be valuable uh, on that roster to teams across the league. So if they did sell, I think they would get real pick capital back. It's just that it wouldn't be their own pick capital. And at that point, you're tanking and you're tanking for nothing then. Yeah. Yeah. I I truly think that like the Nets are in probably the worst position in the NBA right now is where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I don't know where their win is. Yeah. Like Detroit at least has Cade Cunningham. What about the Wizards? The Wizards are a fair argument against this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. But they own all of their own picks. They do. Yeah. 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 Which is a big deal. They do, but the Nets. I mean, as as you mentioned, like those. At, if they are trading them, they have their the value of their trade assets dwarf what the Wizards could get if they if they decide to trade their guys. Hundred percent agree with that, but I don't know that any of the assets that the Nets have outside of Bridges bring back like significant, significant, like high end, high upside value. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it's fair. more going to be like good, like cost control and like team control over prospects, draft picks, etc. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned the Pistons. Let's talk about the Pistons for a second. They're up to four whole wins on the season. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> They've already made one big trade to bring back Mike Muscala, <laughs> Daniel Gallinari. Okay. I, okay. the The script said one trade. Andrew added one big trade. To be clear, there's some big guys. Going back and forth here, okay. <laughs> so talking about the the size of the people, you know. Uh, what do you think is realistic and advisable for the Pistons at this deadline, given their overall lack of draft assets? Should they be willing to trade any of their more valuable young pieces? No, because I don't. If I am running the Pistons and owning the Pistons, I don't want the person in charge to be the person making those decisions. So yeah. no, I would not True. want, yeah. I, I would want to keep all of those assets and move them forward into the summer and look like James Edwards has written a couple of times that like, it seems like Troy Weaver is going to get the summer. Uh, I believe he wrote that. Yeah. Uh, That's so really maybe, I'm out to lunch on that. And that's just not a realistic outcome here. Yeah. But if I'm, yeah, like if I'm the Pistons ownership, I'm just like, honestly, like I would have moved on already and tried to bring somebody in and, you know, hope that they can do something. But uh, no, I, I would keep all of those guys and see where it goes. Yeah. I, I don't disagree at all. Uh, okay, before we go, any is there any big names? Siakam is obviously a, a giant name that was moved, but are there any other like yeah. big names or any guys that you like think could be moved? You know, here as the deadline gets closer. Yeah, like I mean, like Dejounte Murray, Zach Levine, you know, Demar Derozan. Uh-huh. I think those are the ones that you know th- th- that's the size of name that makes sense. I, I mean, look like. Phoenix has not been very good. Uh, they've yeah. been a little bit better of late, but you know they've they've won four of their last six. Mm-hmm. I mean, like if it, if it was to turn for some reason, like you never know, I guess. But mm-hmm. I, I think that that I think they'll be fine and keep this thing locked in. And look, the worry, like you look at the teams that are like under. Hold on, hold on, hold on, right? hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Were you just like, were you about to say Kevin Durant or what were you going to say? Like, what was like? Oh, what no, was... no, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't going there. I, I'm not speculating. I'm not naming any names with Phoenix. I truly don't mm-hmm. know what they were. Well, uh, how to break just, that up. 
I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. You made a little pit stop in Phoenix without saying any names. I just didn't I know. made a pit stop in Phoenix because <laughs> they are an underperforming team that probably yeah. uh, could use some sort of shakeup. Yeah. And it's very difficult for them to shake things up, I think, without any tradable draft capital and with very minimal, interesting young players. So, I, I look, I'm not naming names here. It's just... okay. I wonder uh, if this was to turn, right? Like for some reason, if it was to go from them, you know, having won these last three games against the Lakers, Blazers, and Kings to this big road trip that they have before the deadline where they have to play Dallas, Indiana, Orlando, Miami, Brooklyn, Atlanta, Washington, all on the road, uh, and then Milwaukee at home. Like if that if that run was to cause some issues for them i just i wonder what they would do because matt ishbia seems like a relatively uh impatient person maybe as an owner uh-huh. and like uh there they'd be in a really tricky spot at that point i refuse to name names on uh <laughs> what exactly they would do because i don't know is my <laughs> point uh, the, like the Warriors too, like you just, yeah. I, I do not think they will move Clay Thompson or Draymond Green, Yeah. but this thing is not going well. <laughs> They're 18 and 22 and they are 12th in the West and they're getting further and further back. Like, I, I just don't, I don't know what is like a reasonable expectation for them? Like they are currently two games out of the play in tournament, which isn't a lot, but the Rockets are ahead of them. The Lakers are ahead of them. The jazz are ahead of them in theory. Like you could say, Oh yeah. Like Houston and Utah will fall back, but Utah has been great recently in Houston. I think is like a tough out for teams most nights because they really sit down and defend. So, if you maybe say like, yes, I think the Warriors will make the play in right now, but like, again, if things turn here and continue to turn poorly before the deadline, maybe something crazy happens in terms of their core. Yeah, I could see that. Hey, go read San Vecini on the athletic. Go listen to the game theory podcast. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We don't even get trivia. My God, the whole reason I come on this show and we're not even. <sighs> next time i'm sorry eric name it's uh it's all bucks trivia this week all bucks trivia to, right. to be fair eric will be a better trivia uh guest than me. <laughs> uh thanks so much sam go read sam go listen to him subscribe to the game theory podcast on youtube and on apple Podcasts and all that you won't regret it it's a great show thank you sam all right, Andrew, it is time for the Wheel of Fandom, our weekly segment where we spin a wheel, it lands on a team, and we become fans of that team for the next week. Last week, the wheel landed on the Milwaukee Bucks. It was a roller coaster week for the Bucks. First, they scored 46 points in the fourth quarter to beat the Warriors. They followed that up with a wild overtime game against the Kings, which ended with a Damian Lillard three at the buzzer. And finally, without Giannis in the lineup, the Bucks ended the week with a 40-point loss to the Cavs, only the 13th time in Bucks franchise history that they've lost a game by 40 plus. The Bucks are now 28 and 13 with the fifth-ranked offense and 21st-ranked defense per cleaning the glass. Andrew, if our favorite team is the Bucks, who is our guest? Oh man, it's our guy Eric Name. Ever since ever since that wheel hit Bucks, I was like, man, I'm excited to get to talk to Eric Name about the Bucks this week. Uh, Eric, how's it going, man? Uh, it's good. It is uh, snowy here in the Midwest. I've been uh, had delayed flights. I've had uh, try not to slip every time I go outside. Uh, all of that. But <laughs> you know, that is uh, January in the Midwest. Uh, and I'm just going to keep it rolling when I go to Detroit here uh, later this afternoon. So oh, it'll be yeah. great. Oh, uh, yeah. More of the same, I assume. Hey, the best highlight in the NBA this week happened in Milwaukee, where Damian Lillard hit a big buzzer beater three in overtime to beat the Kings. First of all, you've been to a ton of NBA games, and this was only a regular season game, but how would you compare that moment to other big shots that you've seen? And was there anything unique about that experience in general? I mean, man, I have I have seen some good ones. That's true. 
like you you kind of go through it and honestly it was fun because after the game you got to go through it with one of the best players in the league like yeah. it Giannis takes a long time to get ready but so we're talking an hour after the game has ended 10 minutes into his like his post game session and he's telling us like you know you think about the buzzer beaters that have been hit since I've been with the team Giannis has one of them in Madison Square Garden, a fadeaway jumper from the elbow. Uh, Chris Middleton has two of them. Uh, both like, and he's breaking down why Dames was so much better. He was so excited to like talk about it, and he's like, you know, like after it, I'm like, I'm sitting there hugging him. I choked him out a little bit. I think he was suffocating. Like you, you just have like this insane excitement from Giannis, and it's like, if that dude's that excited, I mean that means I just saw something pretty special. Like if, if one of the, the best players in the league, one of the 75 greatest players in the history of basketball uh, is that excited. I just saw something pretty special. And yeah, I mean, it was, it was really cool to see. Um, obviously you hear about Dame time before he comes to Milwaukee, you know, that he's, he has a pension for hitting big shots. Uh, he has hit some big shots, like not a, a buzzer beater yet, but he's hit some big shots this year. And you know, that was, it's just kind of crazy to think about the the thing in the locker room the guys kept talking about was like this dude need they were down two he needed to go 94 feet because they didn't have a timeout in 5.2 seconds and the thing all of his teammates kept talking about is this man needed to go that far get to the rim to maybe tie it find a shot and he slowed down like he got the ball and he slowed down so that he could set himself up for a step to the side 35 footer leaning and he lets it go and everyone in the gym thought it was going in like that's just how good damian lillard is in those in those situations and as a shooter off the dribble in those moments just being clutch so i mean it was really it was really an incredible shot it, it speaks to kind of what he is capable of in, in the player that he is uh and also it was a good way for the bucks to sneak out a win in a game that they probably shouldn't have been in like shouldn't have been in that situation they probably should have just closed it out against the kings instead of you know blowing a lead and doing all those things so uh you know there are some some real problems in milwaukee uh so that was a nice way to paper over a, a potential loss and instead get a win yeah uh, there's a lot of talk after the trade about how quickly Giannis and dame would mesh and learn to play together how would you assess their on-court relationship at this point in the season I mean, I think it's still growing. I think one, I mean, I wrote about this about 20 games into the season. So about a quarter of the way through the season, them working on their pick and roll, um, you know, relationship and how often they're doing it. And and I think overall, we haven't seen Giannis Dame pick and roll nearly as much as we thought we were going to see it going into the year, like both here in Milwaukee. And then I think anytime you watch the Bucks as an outsider, you go, don't they have Giannis and Dame? And like, Aren't those guys going to just like run pick and roll together all the time? Like you think of, you know, with the Warriors and Steph and Draymond, you turn a Warriors game on, you're going to see some pick and roll. Like those two are going to be in those actions together. And yes, they're going to run their split cut action and all the, the cool stuff that Steve Kerr has installed over the years. But you're going to see some pick and rolls. And with the Bucks, you just don't really see a ton of it. And I think that's kind of been one of the interesting things. Both of them are putting up awesome numbers. Giannis is putting together – the best rim finishing season of his career uh, to this point. He's just putting up insane efficiency numbers. Uh, he, he's been able to score at, and just, I mean, when we're talking about the three best players in the league, all those guys are doing ridiculous things. Jokic, Embiid, and Giannis, like those three big men are pretty untouchable as far as like the MVP conversation goes. But while a lot of the focus has been on Embiid Jokic and we just had an Embiid Jokic game, Giannis is right there with those dudes. Like if you're looking at the numbers and the fact that they got a first year head coach, things haven't been like the smoothest. I mean, if you're thinking about an MVP case for Giannis, it's pretty impressive that they keep winning games. And a big reason they keep winning games is just his individual transcendent play. Um, so he's been great. Dame has struggled a little bit. He hasn't been as efficient as he has been in previous seasons. Uh, he's struggled to find his role a little bit. How does this all work when, you know, you have the greatest transition threat in the history of basketball in Giannis? Um, okay, so if he's bringing the ball up, what do I kind of do in these situations? How, do, how does this work? I'm used to bringing the ball up the floor and, you know, being a threat to hit a pull-up three or, or have defenses worry about me from the start. So 
we're halfway through the season and and I think the the Bucks are still trying to figure out a lot of that. Like they're 41 games in, second best in the Eastern Conference, four games behind the Celtics, 20 and 13 record. So things are going good from a from an outcome perspective, but I think from a process perspective, uh they're really to me still just scratching the surface uh, of kind of what they can do offensively with those two guys together. So one of the games we saw this week was the win over Golden State, which featured rookie Andre Jackson Jr.'s best performance to date, a 10.10 rebound double-double, which included six offensive rebounds in 27 minutes. Uh, Jackson's minutes have been steadily increasing over the season. What kind of development have you already seen in Jackson's game from the beginning of the season until now? I mean, Andre is a fascinating player. Um, You look at kind of what he did at UConn, if you talk to people around UConn, they feel like he's the reason why they won a national championship last year. Like him mm-hmm. figuring out his role and kind of how he functioned as like a point forward type. It was a lot of grab and go. And then he's starting the offense and you hear all those things and you're like, oh my God, he must have been putting up insane numbers. And then you look and he barely scored. Like that's just not something that he does. He's not a scorer. That's not how he does things. He, pushes in transition, throws amazing passes. He has incredible floor vision, sets great screens, does all of those things. But scoring isn't really his thing aside from the highlight dunks that he gets because he's got a 44-inch vertical and he's got this insane athleticism. So he's just this really interesting package. And I think the the things that he's grown into a little bit as this season has gone on is remembering that in the NBA, you do have to be a scoring threat. Like you do have to to yeah. show some of that ability. If you can't, teams just aren't going to cover you. They're not going yeah. to treat you as a threat. Um, they're not going to worry about you. Even if you're trying to set screens, they're just going to go over or under or leave you wide open. Uh, and, and I think what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is starting to look at the rim more. He's starting to be more of a threat uh, as an attacker. And, and that has been really big for him. Uh, on the other end, I think, Man, uh, his foul per 36 rate is out of control. He just fouls (laughs) and fouls and fouls. And some of that is a rookie whistle. I'm not, I'm not trying to deny that. Some of it is the Bucks consistently put him on the best player on the floor. Um, Mm -hmm. and then some of it is just trying to figure out how you can use your hands in the NBA and how you can, you know, he's super strong and he's super athletic and Sometimes if he throws a hip into somebody and that person flops, they're going to get that call or they embellish it. However you want to say, like he's, he's just trying to figure out all of these things. And you mentioned his, his best game against uh, over the weekend. And it was undeniably a great game. Uh, The next game he played 10 minutes because he was in foul trouble the entire time. And that is part of the, you know, up and down roller coaster of, of being a young player, getting a chance to to kind of contribute on a really good team. But the Bucks are going to need him to figure some of those things out, because when you look at what they can do on the wing, uh, if you're trying to figure out how they're going to have wing defenders to go up against the Jason Tatum's of the world, the Jalen Brown's of the world, uh, they probably need Andre to be that guy. Uh, and that is a lot to ask of a rookie. So uh, the learning curve is going to have to go quick and, and he's going to have to find a way to stay on the floor, stay out of foul trouble and, and really make it hard on some of these guys. Halfway through the season and the Bucks are 20 and 13, which is their best start since 1920 for a team that's been so good when it comes to winning games. The conversation around the Bucks this season, both nationally and amongst Bucks fans, has seemed to skew a little bit negative overall whether it be the coach, the defense, Brooke Lopez, or any other topic, are the common concerns about this team overblown? Or is this or is there like validity to like the angst that's in like some corners of the fan base? I think it's it's really difficult to try to figure this team out after watching the team for the last five years. For five yeah. years under Mike Boonholzer, you knew what game you were watching every night. By the end of that five years, I had seen, I'd seen every episode that we were on reruns by the end of year five, like every single night, they're going to be great defensively. They weren't going to fall. They're going to have incredible rim protection. They were going to control the glass. And sometimes could teams hit a bunch of threes? Yes. Yes, they could. That, that could happen. Those outlier shooting games could happen, but that was going to be the way that you were going to beat the bucks was you're going to have to hit some threes tonight. 
that's it. Because if you don't get those threes, you're just not going to score at the rim because Giannis and, and, and Brooke are there and it's not going to work. Uh, that's not the case this year. Brooke is still amazing, leading the league in blocks. He's he's really put together a really strong rim protection season, but their perimeter defense is just not good. It, you look at kind of the way that, and again, this is a, a decision that you make. The, the trade-off that you make when you trade Drew Holiday for Damian Lillard is you're probably going to be a little bit better on one side and a little bit worse on one on the other. Like that's just how this works. And they're not as good as a deep uh, on the defensive side. And it's not just that it's Dame. I think you've also had a downgrade from Grayson Allen to Malik Beasley. Uh, so mm -hmm. now you have two poor on ball defenders, uh, you know, both six, two ish uh, at the guard position and teams just kind of get where they want. And then on top of it, you have Adrian Griffin trying to apply more pressure uh, on the perimeter, and that has led to even larger gaps between, you know, it, back in the day it was Drew Holiday top locking, Grayson Allen top locking, and you really shrink it into a confined space where this guard is going to have to try to force it up over Brooke Lopez, and it's going to be a really tough shot. Now mm -hmm. they have 15 feet of space, 20 feet of space from where they pass the initial screen to Brooke Lopez waiting at the rim and it's put Brooke in some really tough positions and it's made Brooke maybe look, look not as effective, but I just don't think he's been put in a position to succeed. And that's both from a personnel standpoint and a tactical standpoint. Uh, and you combine those two things and then all of a sudden the defense is out of whack. Uh, you know, Seth partner and I got together at the athletic last week and wrote a story about their defense and, and why it's failing. And, and we talked about that, uh, that aspect of it, but also, this year they've decided to switch Giannis a lot more. Giannis is switching one through four uh, way more than he ever did under Mike Budenholzer. And with Giannis, you think of him as this great defensive weapon, and, and there was a lot of Bucks fans that really bemoaned the fact that Giannis wasn't a switcher. Like, why is he just in drop coverage all the time? Like, he's, he's the greatest athlete in the league. He's a freak. Why is he not doing this thing switching that is supposed to show all those things? And – the big reason is because if he's doing that, if he's at the three point line and you have, and you guys are both familiar with this watching Steven Adams over the years, if you have an elite box out defensive center, yep. like you do in Brooke Lopez, someone needs to grab the rebound. Yep. And oh, the, yeah. the genius behind the Budenholzer system was Giannis was always there it, because he wasn't switching. He could just stay on the backside. He could help with the rim protection, but also, when Brooke blocked out three dudes, which he does every possession, he's he's so massive that he's the one that's like in the way of these people. Someone has to swoop in. And right now, because Giannis is switching, Giannis is on the backside, Giannis is covering a shooter, he's out by the three-point line. And that means it's six foot two Damian Lillard trying to grab rebounds. It's six foot two Malik Beasley trying to grab rebounds. It's six seven Chris Middleton trying to grab rebounds. They just don't have size around the rim and their defensive rebound rate has plummeted. And you, you get to these spots where, you know, it feels like, oh, wow, they switched all these things. They might be, they put together a great defensive possession. Well, they didn't finish the defensive possession because they were out of position for all the rebounds that they needed to grab. And you're in this spot. So I think the, the concerns defensively are real. That is something that they need to figure out. Um, they're both, personnel problems and there are tactical problems and and they're going to have to work through that because i think in the playoffs you have to be a lot more solid uh than you are right now uh, i think the you guys i think it's 21 uh at cleaning the glass right now maybe it's 22 in defensive rating um they just aren't good enough defensively you need to see that number if you're going to be a lead offensively that number's got to be 15 and then in the playoffs you got to be able to flirt with top 10 type defense and i don't know if they can do that right now so I think the angst around the Bucks is, one, they're using a different formula this year. They used to be a team that was great defensively and scored enough points. Now they are a team that is built to be a great offensive team that gets enough stops. And obviously with a 28 and 13 record, they've done that on many nights. But also there has been nights where there aren't enough stops. They, they just aren't getting enough defensive stops. And that's to me where this is going to get interesting. The, their first half schedule was a lot easier than their second half schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they had the third easiest schedule uh, to start the season in the first 41. And depending on what you look at, you're looking at a top five toughest schedule 
in the final 41. Um, mm-hmm. And when you look at some of those things and you look at like the the underlying numbers as we have just done, you you look at the second half of the season, you wonder, okay, like what what's going to happen? And, and kind of how is this going to play itself out over a tougher schedule, tougher opponents, more games on the road? Like how is that going to play out kind of as the season unfolds? You mentioned that uh, the piece you did with Seth Part now breaking down some of the issues with the Bucks defense. There was a really interesting section in that about re- opponents recovering the ball after being blocked by Brooke Lopez, which is a stat that you asked Seth to track for you this season. What made you initially reach out to Seth about that specific scenario, and what did you learn from his analysis? I mean, thank you for asking me about it because I'm I'm really proud of that nerd shit. Um, <laughs> like I do a lot of nerdy stuff. Like I'm not uh, that's kind of my thing. But that one I'm proud of. Um, so I mean, initially, kind of what I thought was, um, Brook Lopez rather than being stationed right at the rim, they're asking him to do more. It feels like the blocks that Brook is getting and the blocks have stayed about consistent they've stayed steady is he's he's flying from out of position and maybe not out of position but the position that he's in is not just at the rim waiting like really come on try me here at the rim because you're going to get blocked instead it's like oh my gosh i gotta get to the rim and to me my my initial hypothesis was that rather than being able to just tip it and block it to himself uh since he's flying more balls will be flying out of bounds um, so that was what I asked Seth to, to track initially. And Seth told me, no, it's about the same amount going out of bounds. But what is different is how many of these blocks they're actually recovering. And, and I think to me, the, the fun part of that number is it's really hard to break down NBA defenses in ways that people can understand. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's confusing. You just see numbers, you see plays on the floor and I think a lot of times Bucks fans see someone shooting over the top of Brooke Lopez. People see Brooke Lopez boxing someone out and the rebound going somewhere else. And the thought is Brooke is washed. Brooke is too yeah. old. Brooke is, has lost a step, like whatever it is, because they're used to seeing Brooke block those shots or tip those rebounds to someone or, or whatever it may be. And, and I think that number helps illustrate that, it isn't that Brooke has necessarily lost a step. It's that structurally around Brooke, things don't make as much sense. That you, you you haven't put the support behind him in the way that you need for the great stuff that he does, these blocks, this rim protection, to sustain the defense because his blocks are going to the other team or someone else isn't helping him after he makes the initial play. Um, So uh, honestly, thank you for asking about that number because I'm really proud of that number because again, I think it's really hard to find statistics that can like explain to people this really complex thing you're watching, which is NBA because it can be incredibly confusing to figure out what I'm looking at out on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, Okay. So Trade deadline's coming up. The Bucks aren't really talked about a whole lot, just as they don't have a ton of assets to deal. If they did make a trade, what kind of player would they be looking for? And are there like realistic names that are out there, maybe that you've heard or maybe that fans talk about a lot? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the tough part is Jay Crowder has been out for the last nine weeks, I believe it was. He came back in the Bucks blowout loss in Cleveland uh, on Wednesday. I think that is kind of the archetype of player that you're thinking about for the Milwaukee Bucks. And this is any contender, right? Like you're always looking for more wing defenders, Uh, big wing defenders, small wing defenders. Like you're just looking for wing defenders. Like that's, that's kind of what you're after. Um, And, and the Bucks have been looking for one of those for four years at this point. This is every trade deadline comes around. If we recorded this podcast last year, one year ago, I would have said the Bucks are looking for a wing defender. Uh, And two years ago, I would have said the same thing. And three years ago, I would have said the same thing. So that's always what you're looking for. Uh, But this year, I think it's, it's maybe a little bit more concerning. You don't have one of the best defenses in the league and you know, you're looking at like, Oh, it would be a real luxury to have this great wing defender. I, I think this year it's, it's more of a need. Like, it, I, I think Malik, to be clear, Malik Beasley is, I mean, it, he's putting together the best shooting season in the league at the moment. Like he, he's shooting near 
I think his volume's at five and a half per game. It, yep. He's just – he's hitting all the wide-open catch-and-shoot threes. He's hitting jab-step threes on people. Like, he's just having a really incredible season offensively, but defensively he doesn't really bring that type of tenacity, that intensity that the Bucks have had over the years. So I think it would be nice if they had another pitch to throw. And, again, maybe that is Jay Crowder. Maybe that is Jay Crowder comes back and all of a sudden – you use some small ball lineups that would be like Giannis at center, Jay Crowder at the four, Chris Middleton at the three, uh, and Andre Jackson at the two. And then all of a mm-hmm. sudden, outside of Dame Lillard, you're six, seven, and above, and you're massive, and you can you know try to eat up space that way. That isn't something we've really gotten to see thus far, just because Jay Crowder's been out for the last nine weeks. So um, now I'd be curious to see kind of what that does. But I, th- I think that's largely what you're looking for. What really hampers the Bucks on the trade market right now is they don't, because of their top-heavy roster, and this is true of a lot of teams around the league, this is what modern roster building is, you have a top heavy roster. You have three guys eating up a lot of your salary cap. And in the Bucks' case, four guys because Brooke Lopez also has a big contract. The middle area, which to me is where in season trade deadline trades happen, is between 10 million and 20 million in salary, maybe up to 25 now, or maybe it's 15 to 25, however you want to look at it uh, as the league's salary cap has grown. That's where trades happen. And the Bucs just don't really have a lot of those contracts. Um, you know, you have a guy like Bobby Portis, who's in that r- the lower end of that range. You have a guy like Pat Connaughton, who's even lower. Um, and then all of a sudden you got to figure out like, all right, if I put together Bobby Portis, Marjan Beauchamp, and a second round pick, I think salary wise, you know, you get into the teens, like the low teens, uh, and then are those assets good enough? Also, do you feel like you can actually go around with only two big men in Giannis and Brooke Lopez? Is that enough size? Is Jay Crowder actually a four and that's fine? Or is he too small and you don't have a- enough size? And, and I think that's kind of the the tough part. Like if the Bucks want to make a trade here at the deadline, it it probably has to be Pat Connaughton or Bobby Portis as your, your salary cap like lead right like how you're going to get to the spot where interesting players are available um and, and then you know do teams still want marjan bochamp like has, has he done enough is, is he developing in the way that still makes him interesting and uh you know desirable do you look at that second round pick that they have that's the blazers so that should be a high second rounder this year um is that enough so it's putting that package together and then as far as players that you're looking at i mean I think you probably have to, with those realities in mind, be thinking about, you know, like a guy in Brooklyn, like Dorian Finney-Smith, um, that's, you know, in that salary range where you could potentially make a deal. Um, I mean, you look at a guy like in Cleveland, like Isaac Okoro. Okoro has been more important for them recently because Darius Garland's been out, but Maybe in another month when we get close to the deadline, he's not as important and someone that they want to move. Um, in Phoenix, Josh Okogie hasn't played as Grayson Allen, who Bucks fans ironically really hated for the last year, is putting together a season on par with Malik Beasley. Like he's yeah. he's he's been really, really good. Um, but because Grayson Allen has emerged, Josh Okogie has not, you know been quite as impactful as he has in previous years and those are to me like if you're looking at how the bucks do stuff um that's kind of got to be the range of player that you're talking about and when you're talking about that player that's not a new starter right like that is not someone that's replacing malik beasley that is another pitch that you can throw that is uh, just another way that you can go in the playoffs. And then I I think when you get to that level and you think about it in that way, you have to be thinking about like, all right, is that actually, is that worth it? Because, you know, you got Pat Connaughton at home. Like maybe, maybe Pat Connaughton can do that. Maybe Jay Crowder can do that. Maybe, I mean, if you're trying to find a young, impactful defensive wing, you got some Andre Jackson at home. Why, why not just just try that out? And okay. that, to me, is kind of where you got to go through all of this and, and try to figure out, like, all right, 
we we could potentially make a move and John Horst has always been very aggressive. He always wants to add to the team, but you got to figure out if that is actually worthwhile. Is that something that, you know, is going to increase the likelihood of, of you winning a championship or are you going to get that person and it's just not going to work? Like I, I know the Bucks have been connected to PJ Tucker on the buyout market. And it's like, okay, yeah, you could get PJ Tucker, but it's another situation where don't you already have some PJ Tucker at home? Like, isn't Jay Crowder five years younger than, than PJ Tucker in, I I mean, I would guess in the exact same mold and the exact same role. Uh, So that to me is where this is why you're not hearing the bucks connected to a lot of people, because when you add up, every part of the situation, whether it's salary cap, assets, uh, actual roles that are available for the team, you got to go through all this and figure out like, how much sense does it make to make a trade? Like, what are you actually adding? What are you trying to find? And do you already have that on your roster? And it just needs to be used in a different way or or coached in a different way or deployed tactically in a different way. Um, And that's why I think it it gets a little bit difficult uh, to try to figure out. And and maybe it's as simple as, all right, we got to figure out our own stuff first. We, We have a bunch of guys here. We have a bunch of things here that we could figure out on our own before we go and make a trade for something new. Well, Eric, thank you for answering all of our questions about the Bucks. But it is now time to play Andrew versus the Beat, our weekly trivia show where Andrew goes head to head with an NBA beat writer. This week, the challenger is Eric Name, Bucks beat writer for the Athletic. Eric, you've played this before. I've come up with eight questions about the Bucks. You'll give me a number between one and eight. Some will be easy, some will be hard. And uh, if you get it right, you'll get at least two points. If you get it wrong, Andrew will have a chance to steal, and we'll go back and forth until all the questions have been asked and answered. So, what number? would you like to start out with uh let's go with two question number two my favorite question i don't like that Uh uh-oh if you added brooke lopez's career high in points in a game and robin lopez's career high in points for a game how many points would you have now you get to choose who answers first eric so you can make (laughs) eric or you can make andrew answer first and then you can go higher or lower or you can answer first and then andrew will go higher or lower if Andrew gets it exactly correct, though, he will get a bonus point. So this is the two Lopez brothers' career high in points added together. Um. Wow. Let's go with 72. 72. Andrew, oh. do you like to go higher or lower? Ah. Uh. Gosh, I just don't know what Robin like. Brooke is, is probably high, right? Like he did some crazy stuff in in New Jersey. Um, I'm trying to think what what a realistic thought for Robin <laughs> would even be. I'll say I'll say under, but I don't feel good about it. Well, Eric, you got within three points. Of the correct answer. Oh my gosh. The correct answer was 69. Andrew, yeah. you get the point. Yes. All right. Oh, that was really close. It was very <laughs> that was close. Really close. Uh, I'll go number one. Okay. Damian Lillard hit Wait, a buzzer what was beater for Lopez is high. Uh, so Brooks was 35. So 35. What, 34. Really? Lopez. Is that right? Wow. I know it does sound ridiculous now that I'm saying it out loud, but I did look it up. Okay. Uh, Damian Lillard hit a buzzer beater for the Bucks this week in a win against the Kings. In the last 20 years, there have been seven Bucks to hit a game winning three with two seconds or left in a game, and we're going to name them all. Okay. So once again, this is just game winning threes from a Bucks player. Yes, Eric, you have a question? I have a challenge. You have a challenge. What's your challenge? I believe Brooke Lopez's career high is 39. Oh, yeah. Actually, that is correct. Robbins is 30. Okay. Got got okay. Yeah. okay. Good. Sorry. Um, okay, so these are Bucks players. They had to have hit a game winning three with two seconds or left. There's been seven of them years? in the last 20 years. So last we're going back to like 0405. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So how this works, Andrew will give me a name, then Eric will give me a name. We'll go back and forth. 
till one of you stumbles. So, Andrew, what's your first guess? Uh, Michael Red. Michael Red is correct, Andrew. He did do it. Eric? Um, and Dame Lillard is off the list because he was... Dame Lillard is off the list, and it okay. has to be a three. A game winning three. Uh, Chris Middleton. That is correct. Andrew? Oh, boy. A game winning three. I don't... I'm trying to think when Ray Allen went to the Sonics. Like, I don't think he was there in 04, 05. Um, okay, I don't think it was. What about Brandon Jennings? Brandon Jennings is on the list, Andrew. Yes. There are four names to go. Uh, Mo Williams. Mo Williams is correct. He is Mo on the Williams. list. Got Andrew, Mo back to you. Mo Williams is awesome. Three names to go. Oh boy. Now this is this is this doesn't feel easy now. <laughs> um did Drew Holiday do it? I don't know. Andrew, Drew Holiday did not do it, which means Eric gets the point. The other names, any guesses? Is Carlos Delfino on there? <laughs> he is not. I do I like, like Carlos that. Delfino, though. I like that uh, Brandon Knight, Monte Brandon. Ellis, and uh, Ruben Patterson. The Kobe Ruben Stopper. Did that. Yeah, Kobe Stopper. Ruben Patterson. Wow. Uh, all right, we have a tie game, and Eric, you have control of the board. Uh, three. Question number three. Which of the following is not an official basketball reference nickname for one of the Bucks players? So I'm going to give you five nicknames. <laughs> Four of them appear on Basketball Reference. One Anything of them can appear not. on Basketball Reference. They're not real. That is, that's false. If they're on Basketball Reference, they're real that's and official. False. <laughs> false. Okay. Here are the names. Big Bob, The Mutant, Haboob, WD-40, and Aqua Dagger. Once again, that was Big Bob, The Mutant, Haboob, WD-40, and Aqua Dagger. And it's current <laughs> Bucks? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are current Bucks players. WD-40. I believe Aqua Dagger is a former Buck. Aqua Dagger. I believe Aqua Dagger. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to go with Aqua Dagger because it's who's well, the your, Yeah. Your, your instincts are correct, Eric, because that was a former nickname of Eric Bledsoe, although it was not basketball reference official. It was just a random nickname generator on Reddit, and they came up with Aqua Dagger. All right. Very good. Uh, Andrew. <laughs> Very good. Control the board. <laughs> number four. Question number four. There are only two teams in the NBA that have two players averaging at least seven free throw attempts per game each. One is the Milwaukee Bucks, Dame and Giannis. Who is the other team? Seven free throw attempts. Two players that have at least seven free throw attempts. Per game, yeah. Goodness. I would have said Philly last year, but I don't think that Maxie's doing that this year. Um, goodness. Who would that be? I lean Lakers, but I don't know if AD is doing it, or I don't even know if LeBron is doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, this is a hard question. Out, this is a really hard question. I think like Clippers are another one because there's a lot of ISO there. Those guys get fouled. I just don't know if they get fouled enough. In LA, I guess I'll say the Clippers, but I just don't. I don't know. That just that's just definitely not right. No, I'm not saying it. There's no way that's right. Okay. I take it off the table. Um God, this is a really hard question. This is breaking my brain. Any guesses, Andrew? I know that time is ticking. Shooting. There's no one else shooting that many on the thunder. 
Golly, Al. I don't. I really just have no idea. I'll say Orlando, but I just don't even know. I have no idea. Uh, you don't know, Andrew, and that is incorrect. Uh, Eric, any guesses? I like, know it right away, I think. Um, I'd go with the Lakers. It is not the Lakers. LeBron only averaging five and a half free throw attempts. Would you believe? And I did not know this. It is the Miami Heat. Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. Gross. Are averaging <laughs> over seven. <laughs> gross, Andrew. It's not gross. It's so, impressive. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's a it's a career high for Bam. Wow. Yeah, seven yeah. is a lot. Seven is a lot. Seven point three per game. Wow. Um, okay, so no points there. Back to Eric. We got four questions left. Five. Question number five. The Bucks beat the Celtics by 33 points last Thursday. It was their third win this season with a scoring margin of at least 30 points. There are three teams in the NBA who have had four wins with a scoring margin of at least 30 points. Name all three. You get a point per correct answer. So teams uh, that have been really good at blowing other teams out. Boston Celtics. That is correct for one point. Philadelphia 76ers. That is correct for two points. Can you get the third and final point? Uh, Indiana Pacers. That is incorrect. Andrew, you have a chance to steal. You can get one point here. You can name me the team. Four wins. Blown out. With a scoring margin of at least 30. A scoring margin of at least 30. Goodness. Is it the... Oh, this doesn't feel right. Is it the Kings? I don't know. That doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right because it's not right, Andrew. Uh, yeah. The correct answer, which was the really hard one. Charlotte New Hornets. Orleans, New Orleans Pelicans. Oh. I was, in the end, I was trying to flip it. And like, if they lost by 30 or more, like multiple times. <laughs> I thought yeah, that was yeah. the, the trick at the end. <laughs> That's a good point. That would be actually a fun question as well. Because there's a lot of bad teams. Feel free to use it. I'm, I'm giving you. I'm giving you that. Thank question. you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you're down five to one. Oh. You're getting shellacked. 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 Uh, uh, six. Three questions left. <laughs> six. Okay, here we go. Andre Jackson Jr. was the 36th pick in last year's draft. He has already started seven games for Milwaukee in the past decade. There were two Bucks rookies who started at least 25 games as a rookie who are no longer in the NBA. Name them both. Wait, say it again. So last decade. Yeah. Two Bucks rookies who started at least 25 games during that season. No longer in the NBA. In the last decade, Bucks rookies decade. have started and are no longer in the NBA. Started a lot of games as rookies, no longer in the NBA. Um, one point per correct answer, by the way. In the, wait, in the last decade, that yeah, said? Jabari Parker, correct for one point. Can you get the other one, Andrew? Last decade. I've got a couple of names. I just don't know how much these guys even started or even played. Hmm. The start the starting thing is throwing me off for sure. I've got two names that I think it two is, names. But I just don't know. What about Thon Thon McCurr? Andrew, that is correct. For yes. that other answer, it is now five to three with two questions left. Oh, that was really well done, Andrew. I also Very had DJ well Wilson done. floating around my brain, oh, but DJ I don't, Wilson. I don't think he started enough. No, I didn't. Uh seven. Question number seven. Among NBA players who have played at least 30 games, this Milwaukee Buck has the highest average speed while on the court, according to NBA.com. <laughs> this is going to be weird, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a weird one. Campaign? Campaign is incorrect. Andrew, you have a chance to steal. Pull it to within one. Heading into the final question. Is it Bochamp? Best man in the league. What'd you say, Andrew? Is it Bochamp? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, that is also incorrect. The fastest man in the league, at least by average speed, Andre Jackson Jr. Dang it. Now, Andrew, you still have a chance to 
tie the game up. Okay. Okay. Final question. Okay. Question number eight. There oh. are 13 two-man lineups for the Bucks that have played at least 500 minutes together this season. Okay. All 13 have a positive net rating. Which two-man pair has the highest net rating together at plus 12.2? And you get one point per correct answer. Wait, what? What? <laughs> I thought you're asking for a single one that has the highest. Uh, Yeah, you have to name both players, though, in the two-man. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just feel really confident that I'm going to get this wrong. Um, okay. <laughs> Good place to start from. What about Giannis and Malik Beasley? Giannis is correct for one point. Andrew, is the other name Malik Beasley? I don't know. No, it's not Malik Beasley, which means Eric gets the win this uh, week, five to four. The other name, Chris Middleton. Oh, it's like classic. <laughs> I mean, I, it was a straightforward one. Sometimes it was a little too straightforward. Way. Usually they're wonky. Usually they're weird. <laughs> kind of go a little bit weird. That wasn't that weird. He's shooting the ball lights out. Hey, go read Eric name on the athletic, please. He's a very good writer. He, he writes um, like st definitely writes stuff for like mainstream Bucks fans, but also like the most super nerdy stuff that you could ever dream of. It's it's great, great work. Um Go check it out. Eric, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, Andrew, that was Bucks Week. Bucks. What a week it was. Uh, but we got to choose a new team because this is the Wheel of Fandom where every week we spin a wheel, lands on a team. We become fans of that team. There are 20 teams remaining. Ooh. I'm, I'm, listen, this isn't a shot at Detroit, but we just watched the Bucks. And their next two games are against the Bucks. Right. Do we need do we need more Bucks? I don't think so. Do we need more I Pistons? So. I don't think so. No. Did I just guarantee that we will get the Pistons? Yeah, probably. probably. Okay. Pistons. Let's spin the wheel. <laughs> see who our team is going to be. Charlotte Hornets, owners Charlotte. of the worst or the longest losing streak. Currently in the league. Wow. Charlotte hey, Hornets. At least LaMelo's back. Yeah, let's see. They got any games? Oh, hey, you know, the next game, Friday night against the Spurs. Okay, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, we got Wimpy. Maybe, nice. maybe they'll sell off some of their pieces for the trade deadline. We can talk about that. That's a great point. Uh, then they play Philly on Saturday. They play at Minnesota on Monday. And then we didn't escape them completely, Andrew. At Detroit. Wednesday, January twenty fourth. That that's, could that could that be the Detroit's fifth win? Could it's actually, be good, yeah, it's actually a good matchup because they're both, te both teams. I mean, if bad. if you're going to get one of the teams at the bottom, you want games where they're playing the other bad teams, so you yeah. at least feel like you're on some equal footing. You get to see some yeah. of the young players for both teams. So we did pretty well, honestly, all things considered. Spurs and Pistons, well. we'll take it. Hey, you can do pretty well too if you leave us a five star review and Apple Podcast. We'll read it on the show. This one comes from Josh. Gonchar, he says, five stars. Slam and Jam faithful. Slam and Jam is an incredible mix of NBA recap, analysis on stats, stat points on an interesting player team, and just straight entertainment with great guests. And who could not love Andrew versus the Beat? You are sure to get a healthy dose of anything you're looking for from an NBA show. Overall, a great pod, and led by two of the best. P.S. A proud down to dunk crossover. Thunder are back, baby. Thank you, Josh, for that and for listening to both of our shows. Yeah, if you want to hear more from us, you can go listen to the Down to Dunk podcast on Apple Podcasts, part of the Athletic Podcast Network. And then this one from Lance in Wisconsin. Five stars. Well, Andrew, it all started a few weeks ago when I was remodeling my bathroom. In true NBA podcast sicko fashion, I'd already listened to the other 11 shows I had downloaded that week. Then on came the Saturday Slam and Jam. Thank you so much for that review. If you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, we will read it on the show. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend and the basketball. We will talk to you guys again next week.